because now that you are going to see us the high point of this day, maybe of the whole week, uh, Dan Chasny is my good friend, colleague, he, by the way, wrote together this article I mentioned, the last after fable of the Czech Republic. Um, Dan is an author of the book you all got. Uh, the book is also available online in EPUB and Kindle version. You can download it if you want. Uh, Dan specializes in international trade and link between theory and policy. Uh, currently, he is Associate Professor of Economics at the University of Economics in Prague, and uh, he is Associate Dean, making lives of students easier, and everybody indeed likes him. Not, not other Associate Deans and other faculties, but students, and that's what comes, they all like him. He is, as you will soon hear, a perfectionist in many ways, the way he speaks, the way he presents, and I guess we all should warmly welcome him, him here. Yeah. Now this all sounds very well and nice. Um, of course, this is the worst thing you can do for me, create an expectation of that sort. Um, the only thing I can do is uh, not to disappoint you too much, uh, but I will I'll really do my, uh, do my best to walk you through what I want to show you. Um, now, the title of my talk tonight, today, Economics of Economics, is usually something that when, when people see it for the first time, they think I, I've made a typo or something, you know, or, or I suffer from some sort of speech or writing disorder, <laughs> or a stammer type or something. No, this is really meant to be Economics of Economics. I, for a while, I believed I, I invented that, but um, of course, the, the deeper I, I dug, I, I find out that there were other people. Um, for me. But anyway, it's really meant to be economics of economics. And why economics of economics? Well, it's essentially, um, you know, other people, other, other speakers on this event will talk about different social aspects from the economic point of view, from the historical point of view, from the philosophical point of view, etc., etc. And I want to talk about economics, not necessarily liberty, but economics, from the economic point of view. That's why, hence the title, Economics of Economics. So, like a, in, in a broad sense, economic theory of economic <coughs> science. Um, now, you can see the presentation <coughs> outline. It looks fairly simple. And this has a good reason, because I've been to um, teaching workshops and seminars, and I know one thing, that people can pay attention only to, for 20 minutes. <coughs> so if this is going to be 60 minutes, 40 minutes of that will be commentary that you don't have to listen to. <laughs> the problem, though, is to make sure the important 20 minutes come at the beginning, right? <laughs> Which I cannot guarantee. <laughs> So, but you can, you can give it a try. Uh, well, I'll give it a try myself, but you will give it a try to, uh, to find out who, who, what those 20 minutes were. Um, let me start with the motivation for this. You know, why, um, why don't I talk about economics of physics or economics of geology or something like that? Why economics of all sciences, right? How does it fit in? And then this seminar, which is devoted predominantly to the question of liberty, social order, uh, well, liberty, libertarianism, and things like that. Um, now, the reason for that is that, guess what? Economics is really special. Not only to me, but it, it's special for two reasons that are relevant um, for this event, for this libertarian uh, workshop or seminar. Um, one reason is that economics seems to be uh, the master weapon in the libertarian arsenal, by, by which I mean this. You can argue in favor of liberty from many standpoints. You can have, you can make up 
an ethical set, um, ethical argument in favor of liberty. Um, but I think what is most persuasive for most people, for the majority of people, are economic arguments. Arguments that are that can show that society will not only be, uh, you know, some when people are free, society will not only be just, but it's going to be richer, right, or something like that. People are receptive to these arguments. I'm not saying it's somehow, I'm not going to go into the argument that it's somehow a better argument in its essence, but it's certainly from the marketing point of view, so to speak, it's certainly the more powerful one, right? Um, after all, it's no, uh, no coincidence that most libertarians are indeed economists. Right? If, you, if you look at uh, if you look at libertarian scholars, libertarian papers, most of those papers are either written by economists or are using economic arguments. Right? Even if you listen to to uh, you know libertarian historians or historians that are writing that are writing in this in this tradition, they are writing about liberty, but they they generally use economic arguments in favor of liberty. Right? They 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 show on historical records how liberty worked and vice versa, how restriction of liberty uh, was a cause of social disaster. We can also um, turn it around like this and say that most economists are also libertarians too, right? So it works both ways, and there is a good reason for uh, for that too. The reasons for which we will we may go into later on. Generally speaking, economics as a science. Um, traditionally, is associated with libertarianism, although it's not an open association. Um, Adam Smith was certainly not saying, hey, I'm a libertarian, but the things he was, he was saying, and things that economists are today, by and large, claiming that the mean economic opinion were the, the parent, right? Uh, I like to think about Paul Krugman as having as saying very many libertarian things, right? He he is not my favorite economist, but very many things he's saying are or impress the rest of society as being libertarian. And he would also he would uh, uh, kill me if he heard me saying that he's libertarian, of course, right? But he is saying those things. So this is one reason why talking about economics is okay here. I mean, why, why it is important for you to understand the background of economics and the link to liberty. There's a second reason, though, for, um, for talking about economics here, on, uh, although that's on a slightly broader scale. And um, that has to do with a, with a very peculiar position of economics um, among other sciences with respect to one thing. And let me let me clarify this in the following sense. What most economists think, if asked at least, is that they believe economics op offers a lot by way of or offers a lot of insights um, that have the potential to improve um, the um, the way the society works, the way the society is organized, right? Um, however, there is the flip side of it again, is that these insights are mostly and and you know, you know, in a long uh, for a long time have been ignored or disbelieved or ridiculed. Way we can express that. In other words, the interesting aspect about economics, and this is the, uh, the thing about um, my book. This is this is what my book is about, essentially. 
Uh, the interesting thing about economics is that um, a lot of what economics says is openly disbelieved by, by either other scientists or by the lay people. Right? If you ask people about uh, you know, astronomy, the essentials of astronomy, you know, does, uh, what is the shape of the Earth? Does the Earth uh, goes around the sun or the other way around? Even kindergarten school kids know that, right? No, no answers to this. Now, when you look at the economic insight, even the most essential economic insights are just, people are ignorant of them, or if they're not ignorant, if they heard it someplace, they think it's some kind of special theory that doesn't really apply to the real world. Right? If you, if you ask average citizen, average, average adult citizen on the street, people believe that prices are set by, by uh, you know, the merchants that are trying to, um, that essentially prices are all controlled by, by the merchant, by, by the sellers, or by government, or something like that. There's no hint to the idea that it's an interplay of supply and demand, things like that, right? So in this sense, uh, economics is, is, is like, um, like uh, sciences in the Middle Ages. You know, it's, it's totally ignored. Economists have been saying the same thing for, for centuries, and people still have not learned um, much from economics. Now, um, we may later speculate about particular reasons why that happens, but let me, let me just illustrate that this feeling has been around for, for, for a while, but it's, it's definitely not anything I have noticed or, or I have pointed out. Um, consider the following statement by Simon Newcomb, which was, which was made in 1893, almost, yeah, more than 100 years ago, 120 years ago. He says, that you cannot eat your cake and have it too is a maxim taught to the schoolboy from earliest infancy. But when an economist applies the same maxim to the nation, he is met with objections and arguments not only on the part of the thoughtless masses, but on the part of influential and intelligent men. Right? Even you know, learned people think, oh, don't tell me that there is no, no such thing as a free lunch. Right? They, you know, they, Society can somehow handle that. Um, in 1926, um, an economist named Hoover, not the president, but uh, another another people, another guy, um, uh, said, "There is probably no science which has made so little progress in its application as the science of economics." This is almost literally the feeling that I've had, and uh, that motivated my research into this area, right? Uh, this, Almost, as I said, almost literally what I was thinking about. And this was in 1926, right, uh, almost 100 years ago. Uh, and feelings of that sort still remain among the kind of my profession. So the first fact, or the, the, the reason why, the second reason why it's interesting to talk about economics is that economics is to that extent somehow uh, somehow ignored and um, and uh, ridiculed. Now, the content of my book essentially goes into the heart of the matter and tries to explain why that happens. Which brings me to um, the link between theory and policy. In other words, how does the insights, the theoretical insights of economics, how do those insights transform into policy? Right? So essentially it's a, it's a sociological question of the transformation of knowledge you know, from different parts of society. Now, uh, let us start, and I of course like to call that link the market for economic ideas. You know, economists have that habit that anytime they talk about something, they they try to model it as a market, or at least they, they call it market. Um, so my market for economic ideas 
Um, I'll start with the naive version, right? The, the version that uh, people would like to believe is the case. Now let's, um, of course, if, if it's a market, we, have, we need to have supply and demand on the market for economic ideas. The economic ideas are supplied by the theory or by the theorists, that is, the, the economists. On the other hand, we have demand for economic ideas, which is constituted by policymakers, by people who, um, who design policy. Those may be either politicians or the people working for government in, in various non-elected positions. Even those people, of course, have a lot, lot of influence over the actual policy. Now, this is a neat version because it works like this. The policymakers formulate a problem saying, oh, we want to make our people happy or we want to make our people richer. Hey, economists, tell us what we're supposed to do in a particular area. Should we do this or that? This is the sort of um, question. So, so they define social problems or goals and ask economists for answers uh, or about, about the answer for those uh, problems. Um, now, I leave aside the, the question of how these social problems and, and goals, um, how are these problems defined or, or how are they set? Uh, of course, in democracy, we like to believe that the politicians essentially somehow uh, calm, somehow um, accumulate the wills of many people together and they they formulate what is uh, the closest thing to what the mean person wants, right? What the, what the average citizen wants, right? So again, that's, that would be part of the naive version that uh, really the goals are good in the first place. But anyway, um, what economists do are is that they, they simply listen to the question, they, they are experts, and they come up with the answer of what is supposed to be done. And of course, what the politicians will do is that they will listen to economists, what they tell them, and they'll do it. And the goal is achieved. And if it's not, it's probably because uh, something went wrong, or maybe, theoretically speaking, of course, the, the economists might have been wrong too, but uh, this, this, you know, this is why. But I call it a naive version because this is essentially what Decidedly, politicians want us to believe because they want us to believe that they are merely um, that the policy is nothing arbitrary. That their policy is really the, the, the application of scientific principles. Right? There's nothing. It's not like that. What government does is the will of a prime minister or something. It's it's just that. Prime Minister, from the elections, he, he got a signal that people want A to happen, and he asked economists what is supposed to be done if A is to be achieved, and economists told Prime Minister to do B, so Prime Minister does B. It's merely an applicant. That's, you know, this, this, I believe this tradition, this, this thinking, um, goes back to the progressive era, uh, where, where government assume, uh, or the polit when politicians assume the role, roles of, of managers of society, of, you know, like scientific managers of society. So this is the naive version, and my, my claim is that it doesn't really work that way. Um, so guess what, we'll move to the uh, real world version, or the more sophisticated version, if you will. Um, and if we start from the naive version, as, as, we, as we saw it before, I, I suggest to make, or I suggest that there's a need to make the final, uh, the, the, these following adjustments to it. Um, first of all, um, over here, not everything that government, that, that the, um, Economists are saying is will come by the politicians in the same way. Why? Well, we have to understand that this is essentially a public choice insight that 
surprisingly uh, you know, saw the light of uh, the world in the second half of the 20th century only. Before then, politicians, when you think of it, this is unbelievable, but more or less, up until the public choice theory said it explicitly, the implicit assumption was that politicians will always do the good thing. We, of course, may have some bad politicians too, but, but generally speaking, we, we will leave that aside, right? Whereas the public choice inside was, hey, wait a minute, the economists are flesh and blood people too. They have their motives, they have their selfish motives, they have their, their selfish goals too. They're not that they must be selfish only, or that they must be mean, but they are a mixture of, of a person that wants to do good for the rest of society, and a person who wants to do good for himself or herself, right? And that's enough to introduce this, this aberration, that is, I want to essentially, in other words, mouse politicians um, naturally want to engage in policy. They want to do something. Right? Why? First of all, it makes them feel great about it. Right? Perhaps they, um, they may sincerely believe that. Right? It makes them uh, proud of themselves that they do something for the, for the rest of society. See, you have to realize that even if you assume politicians are angels, they will still be inclined to engage in policy rather than not to engage in policy, be passive or something. They, they're motivated to be active because if you're active, then you can be proud of yourself for doing something. Right? So, um, politicians, the policy makers, are naturally um, motivated to engage in policy. And if you're motivated to engage in policy, then, of course, you will way more, you will appreciate way more if an economist tells you, hey, you gotta, this and, you gotta do this and that, rather than if the economist says, well, I don't think you should do anything here, right? This is, for various reasons, not a very attractive thing to hear, let alone do. Um, so one thing for, for this aberration here is that, as I said, politicians want to engage in policy for a good feeling, or, and this is the second possibility, you may also be a mean politician, or, or a politician that wants to do good for himself or herself. That is, um, I want to keep this enterprise as government property because then I can decide who's going to be the director of that of that enterprise. And of course, the idea that my brother will be a director of that enterprise is attractive to me, right? Rather than if, if some private owners decide over that. Right? So there are very many reasons to repeat why um, both selfish and not selfish, why politicians are inclined to engage in policy. And, and hence, they tend to differentiate between theories. And they're more likely to welcome interventionist answers or interventionist policies rather than non-interventionist policies. So the idea that some of you uh, or reasons that are not entirely clear to me, flip, we're flipping through my book already, <laughs> understand um, or, or notice that I, I call it a policy C. That is, there's a tendency for the, for the economic theory that, that makes it to the politicians or that, that is actually being practiced or being heated to be biased towards interventionist theories. In other words, Anytime economists say, hey, you should do this and that, they will gladly take it and use it. Anytime 
economists say, no, you should not mess up with this, they pretend they're not hearing it. Right? Or they, they think, oh, but this is a special case, well, we have to consider that, and blah, blah, blah. And not only that, in some cases, and I, would, I, would, I have some examples later on, not only will they be especially or particularly receptive to interventionist answers, but they will, they will somehow uh, sometimes take those interventionist answers and twist them so that they're even more interventionist than they were really meant to be. Um, I'll talk about some interesting examples later on. So, when we introduce this policy C, this leads to the following thing. That economists see that only like part of what they're saying is being heeded. In other words, that the, this the policy is not reflecting what they are thinking in, in a fair way, right? Um, and this leads to the uh, what I call frustration of economists uh, with the way policy reflects the theory. And after all, I I read a couple of sites here uh, that illustrate that frustration. Um, by the way, as an aside, um, you have to understand that economists are on record from the very beginning to be very interested in, in policy, that is, in making the society work better. Economists were never motivated uh, to engage in research for purely scientific reasons. They were not the searches for pure truth or something. They, they wanted, they explicitly said, they wanted to change the world by studying economics, by understanding how the world works, and by applying that to the real, real world. No wonder then, that if, if you want to change the world, then you keep saying something to the politicians and they keep ignoring that or they keep listening only to to the 30 percent of you then it's a natural thing to be frustrated with that right so economists are frustrated um, that's the that's the first outcome that, that's what happens on um, the supply side right the, the, Economists being on the supply side, they become frustrated. Now, um, at the same time, the demand on the part of policymakers is not uh, is not does not come only from elections, or does not come from uh, politicians as as angels who want to do good for the people. Uh, Politicians have very many goals, and some of them are not necessarily um, close to anything like a public um, public good. Um, but politicians or policymakers learned to use economics as a tool for justification of what they are doing. Right? In other words, uh, they started. Not only tell, not only uh, ask economists, hey, what are we supposed to do if we want to make the, the world richer? But they started to, uh, although not perhaps op that openly or explicitly, they started to ask questions like, hey, can you think of a, of a reason why we should keep doing this? Right? And this gave a motivation to economists. To, to adjust what they're producing, to adjust the product they were producing, to, um, to be more successful at selling it. Um, by the way, how, how do, how do uh, the policymakers do this? How can they influence what the, what the economists are willing to say? Of course, one one solution is, is money. Um, we all know that government um, offers grants for research, uh, that government offers well-paid positions. 
But it doesn't have to be mere money. It, it, it has to do with the social status. Right? And, uh, in the 20th century, of course, there was a tremendous rise in the numbers of economists that were employed by government. Right? And this machinery of economists were there, of course, officially, according to the naive model, to, to produce answers to the pressing problems, but at the same time, and everybody, you know, many people recognized that, that they were there to justify what the minister or what the government was doing. Right? And hence, the demand changed from asking questions to, uh, to uh, requesting justifications. So what happened as a result on the supply side is that First of all, economists learned to produce something that was more interventionist than before. In other words, they learned that if they come up with a theory that says, hey, government, you should do uh, this and that, it's going to be more successful with the government than if economists keep saying, hey, government, you should not do this and that. Right? So they learned they were somehow um, motivated to produce more interventionist answers than before. Why right? when you when you see the dynamics of this? Um, at the same time, some economists, especially those who um, who had uh, <coughs> greater proclivities to pure theory, uh, decided to do, to turn to, to research that's, that's totally abstract, that's totally policy irrelevant, right? So the product of economics that originally was very much policy oriented, we now see that economists are producing things that are, that are, mm, that have no bearing for policy, right? Questions like, uh, you know, what are all the conditions for having one equilibrium only in a particular situation, right? They all recognize that this is this is a problem that that has no real world counterpart, but still they're engaging in it and they're writing papers about it, right? <clears throat> so this is how um, how the naive model is. Uh, expanded into the real world version, and again, to sum up, the, the, the differences are that uh, policymakers are not equally receptive to all sorts of theories. They are biased towards the interventionist theories. The policymakers themselves start to make economists want to produce more interventionist theories because it pays them better or it makes them feel better, right? And that's why we see that the um, the product produced by economists is getting more interventionist in time and less policy relevant. Now, before I proceed to the history side of this, uh, of this picture, um, let me just mention that I don't want to suggest that economists are, are like mm, prostitutes that can be hired for just about anything that they, you know, government pays them and they will say what they want to hear. You have to understand that if you have large numbers of economists, it simply works by eliminating economists who are more, um, say, violently against interventions. It eliminates them from the profession. And the people who stay in the profession are the people who are friendly towards intervention. Right? Um, or um, people who were motivated to change the world are leaving the profession and are becoming um, uh, bakers or something, uh, rather than an economist. And people who, who stay are mathematicians, mathematical economists who produce policy relevant answers for policy relevant uh, theory. Right? Now, 
this is like a like a model framework for thinking about the problem, for, for thinking about the trends and dynamics of it. Now, let us look at a stylized um, history of the economic science. Uh, that is the, the story of economics. Um, now, if we arbitrarily or not, or, or not start in 1776, um, I already mentioned Adam Smith. Um, he's not explicitly libertarian. He's not talking, he's not saying uh, the political economy means liberty and things like that. But on many places in the wealth of nations, you will see the link between the freedom and uh, the just order of society or, or the wealth of society. After all, after all, what he was interested in was the wealth of the nations, right? And he, he was trying to make the case, uh, he was trying to make the following case. If people in certain areas are left, are given a greater freedom, it's actually going to improve a lot for everybody, right? It's just as simple as that. So, although he was not trying to be, uh, to make an ethical case for that, he, he was saying something that today we would consider libertarian. In fact, Wealth of, Nation, Wealth of Nations, uh, the book, can be considered um, like a massive manifesto against government interventionism. The whole book four of the Wealth of Nations is about how the current system is bad, how the mercantile system, uh, as he called it, is bad. The, the system of government meddling with just about everything. Right? Uh, so, I suggest that, I don't think this is very controversial, uh, that there were the beginnings of economics were distinctly libertarian. Um, one, I can perhaps right now I, I can introduce uh, first example of a particular theory that uh, that illustrates these trends, and that's uh, the international trade theory, uh, or the the ideas behind. Uh, behind the policy recommendations uh, for international trade. The whole Wealth of Nations is uh, a plea for, as you know, uh, a freer trade. Not, not totally free trade, perhaps, but a way freer trade than was the norm at that time. And uh, this position that trade should be freer was almost like a like a defining aspect of being an economist, right? You could not be in the 18th century. You could not be an economist who would think that there should be more tariffs, right? It, they would think you're a fool. You, you, you know, they would say, okay, you're you're an economist if you say so, but essentially nobody thinks that, right? So that's why I say that economics have distinctly libertarian uh, roots at the beginnings. Of course, what was happening then, as you know, Adam Smith was, or could have been in favor of free trade, but nothing was happening, not, not much was happening in that way. It, it was really, it took several decades before government even started to consider changes in those, uh, in those um, questions, or in those um, laws that, uh, for instance, in the, in, the, in the trade policy, that is, um, it took decades be before government started to consider changes in tariff books and, and, um, and other laws that govern imports. So policymakers were relatively reluctant to listen to economists that that kept saying government should do, should not do this and government should not do that. Right? So over time, the frustration grew. And uh, but, okay, the frustration grew, and in say at the turn of 19th and 20th century, we can see 
And it's, in, in Europe, there, this was sooner than that, especially under the German tradition. Um, we can see a marked shift from, from this predominantly libertarian tradition in economics to, more, to a m more moderate version of it. Right? In other words, this is what I, what I before uh, suggested was happening in the, in the theoretical framework. Uh, the frustration produced this change and economists learned to produce a product that would sell that. In other words, they started to say something that the government is likely to receive in a better way and receive and use. Um, which produced the great interventionism, or at the same time, economists or some economists started to produce things for themselves. This is the beginning of the policy irrelevant work, uh, say in 1920s, uh, 1930s. Uh, a lot of Microeconomic theorizing, for instance, was was considered, or we can now consider it, policy or love. Right? It might have been interesting and intellectually provoking, but if it did not exist, the world would not be significantly poorer in terms of insights or in terms of knowledge. Now, um, perhaps in order if I uh, in some examples. This is the time when, when um, economists started to search for for room for government intervention. You know, so far for 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 century, economists kept saying the government should keep its hands off the economy. And some economists understood that if they could come up with a reason why government should do this or that, it's likely to to earn them some morals. Right? Uh, and the product of this is the uh, is the uh, market failure theory. That is namely um, the, the monopolistic competition and, and well the whole uh, the whole uh, imperfect competition. Uh, theory that created, that essentially pointed out that markets are, of course, nice and well, but only as long as they are perfect. But, of course, they are not perfect, hence, there is a room for some intervention, perhaps. Right? And what the politicians, of course, and this goes back to uh, what I said in, in the theoretical framework, they will gladly uh, receive this, this, this news that finally there's a theory that proves that markets are not always great. There's a market failure. And they not only received it, but they, they took it and twisted it so that it means a blank justification for, for almost any intervention um, into the markets. It's interesting that uh, you know most most government officials or most uh, most uh, people that I call policymakers have not heard much about theory of competitive advantage, for instance, which is a bulwark of the free trade tradition. On the other hand, almost all of them know about the market failure when it comes to information asymmetry or monopoly power and things like that. They don't, they don't know much about it, but they know enough for them to be to take it as a justification for what they're doing. Right? So, so market failure is, is, the, is, I claim, the product of, of this search for theories that would enable government to do more than, than the classicals were saying or what we're allowing for.
Um, and as I said before, the policymakers also learn to use economics as as a manufacturing plan for justification for what they were already doing or what they had been doing for a long time before. Um, now, how did they how did they do it? Or or an, or an example of these of these uh, phenomena? I can I can illustrate it with uh, what I call the the shifts in definitions, right? That for for strange reasons or for uh, reasons that I don't think were very well documented. Um, there were defi definitions in, of economic phenomena that transformed from um, well, I, I can't even explain it uh, in, in, in words. I'll, I'll use the example. Consider the definition of inflation. Right in 19th or up until 19th century. It's interesting to notice that inflation was a term that was used for expanding the money supply, right? If money supply expanded, this was called inflation. And, of course, the only practical or plausible culprit for that was the government, right? And for most authors in, in 19, up until the 19th century, uh, there was a clear association between inflation and government. It was like, you know, we have to prevent government from printing so that we don't have inflation, or, or so that the government does not engage in inflation, or the king does not engage in inflation, right? Now, in the 20th century, miraculously, inflation took on a substantially different meaning, now meaning the rise in the price level. And this seems pretty innocent, but when you think of it, it absolves the government from responsibility for inflation, or at least in the eyes of many people. In other words, this shift in the definition of inflation, for instance, um, cut the link between government and inflation. And today, uh, it's very few people associate government with inflation. In fact, the government institution that oversees the money supply, that is the central bank, in many countries explicitly fight the inflation. They, they say, we are here in order to prevent inflation, to, to make sure there's price stability, right? So when you think of it, it, it goes high, high 80 degrees, right? It started as something that government was responsible for, and now the shift in definition creates ground for believing that we need government in order to be protected against inflation, so that we don't suffer from it, right? Or, or we don't suffer the consequences of it. Similarly, we could, uh, I could uh, mention the case of uh, the term monopoly. Right? Again, Monopoly for centuries, up until really late or early 20th, 20th century, monopoly was a government grant, a privilege. Right? If somebody had a monopoly, it meant government gave to that somebody an exclusive right to do something and prevented others from engaging in the same activity. This was the definition of monopoly. In the 20th century, with the theory of imperfect competition, monopoly was defined in terms of market power or in terms of market share, right? And again, the link between monopoly and government, which was clear because it was it was defined that way, was cut, and we now, and this is how many people think about it, we now need government for us to be protected against monopoly. Right? That is, government protects us through its antitrust policy, protects us against 
the bad effects of, of monopoly. So government, again, turned from, a, from originally being the culprit into a savior or a protector. Now, um, luckily though, I, I still claim that to this very day, despite all those, all those uh, processes that are taking place, uh, we still, I, I think it's still safe to say that the average economic opinion or the, the mean opinion of the profession as a whole is still distinctly libertarian. And, and that's for, for the reason that I hinted at at the beginning. In, in many cases, the economic case in favor of liberty secures two things. It secures <clears throat> greater wealth and greater justice. Right? If you prevent inflation, you are very likely to Create both, right? Greater, greater, uh, you know, you know, lower, um, lower differences between people, and uh, a greater pie, right? The same holds for many instances of regulation. Um, so even people, as I mentioned, Paul Krugman, but there are others who would never think of themselves as libertarian, but, but who actually have um, very distinctly libertarian um, ideas. I, I like to think about Alan Blinder, who uh, I believe served uh, on the Council of Economic Advisors, and he, he wrote a book, that was in 1987 or something, he wrote a book, uh, Hard Hats, Soft Hearts, in which he claimed that you know, you don't have to be conservative, I mean politically conservative, in order to be, uh, to endorse many of the plans that are considered conservative, such as deregulation and, and uh, you know, market for um, pollution permits and things like that. And he says, well, you got to have hard hats, that is, you got to be rational, and if you combine it with soft hearts, still, very many of those um, conservative suggestions will pass and should be uh, should be endorsed. So not all is wrong, and I think there's a there's a good reason to be happy about it. Um, this, this was not explicit enough. I'll I'll, um, I'll add that. Now. Um, What's the moral of the story, and this is still missing on, uh, on that presentation, um, and by the way, that's, that's again on purpose because uh, some research shows that um, it's good not to have certain things in the presentation so that people uh, are motivated to remember them more than if they were in the presentation. So, you know, it's all very sophisticated. Um, <laughs> So the moral of the story is um, that economics has the potential to make the case for liberty stronger. And I believe people would receive the ideas uh, that are the, the ideas about liberty better if they understood economics better. Unfortunately, this is not the case. There's not much by way of education. You only, you know, people learn about economics only when they're in, in college, and even that is not something that all college students are exposed to. Um, when you think of it, this is this is somewhat strange when that all students go through biology and you know the geology and all things like that at elementary school, but economics only counts at a college. Although economics is a, is a science that um, actually, that, that has a potential to make the world a really better place. So my, uh, I, I like to think of the message of this talk as being a very optimistic one, 
in the sense that if people finally learn that the earth is not flat, and they, they learn this lesson after a couple of centuries, if they finally learn that rent control doesn't work, that it's, you know, we may feel bad about people having to pay a lot of money for, for living, but rent control is not a solution. When we learn that minimum wage is not, so, not a solution to poverty and that tariffs are not a solution to poverty, then the world would be a better place, even for liberty. I thank you, and I'll be looking forward.